All right, hello AP World History students. Welcome in, we have a lesson 2.3 today um, about Jung He and Da Gama, two names that we might remember from our good old Gun Germs and Steel book. Some of the stuff today you might say, hey, I remember that, and that's good. You guys are sage veterans of AP World History at this point. Um, you know, uh, in, uh, in our period two, 1450 to 1750, we kind of set the table in our first two lessons by talking about Europe's Renaissance and then Europe's Reformation. And that was just trying to uh, help us understand the lay of the land in Europe. Um, and now we're going to get really pushed off on the big story of, of, uh, of this period of time, which is like global interconnections, all right? Um, the age of exploration that leads to like fully globalized networks of trade and, and uh, communication. So not just interregional ones, but ones that are sort of encompassing the whole globe. And that's a slow process, of course, but we'll see that start to kick off here today. Um, this age of exploration, uh, it starts with Zheng He in China. It, it becomes a European thing, and this is part of the transition we'll talk about today. It sparks, once they get connected with the Americas, it sparks what's called the Columbian Exchange, which is one of the big, big, big ideas in AP world history. We'll learn about that next time, but that's like probably maybe the single biggest idea uh, or process that you need to be able to describe from this whole period of time. Uh, we're also seeing the start of European hegemony, uh, and hegemony means sort of like a dominance over other groups, uh, the ability to sort of dominate or control other groups or other places. And, uh, and that's going to be the big story uh, really here in 1450 to 1750 and then 1750 to 1900. And then the process of the world wars is going to be kind of undoing that eventually. Um, and we also, sometimes this, is, this period of time is also distinct. We call it the early modern period because we're seeing the first blossomings of, of things like we would, that we would call maybe constitutionalism um, or capitalism or the Enlightenment. Uh, these are things that are really going to uh, have very, very powerful effects in the next period of time, but we, we see them starting to come to the surface here. Um, but this, this uh, question of, of world interconnectedness, it was not something, guys, that's like it was always fated to be Europe. In fact, Europe was probably the last place you would have guessed that was going to be the place that was going to sort of pull the world into a sort of a singular network. Um, you know, if you had to be sitting, we, we learned, you know, in the, in the, what, the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the Mongols really uh, were sort of a major force for that. There was the Islamic world was, was pulling places together. Uh, China is always a significant leader. And it looked really, uh, in the 1400s, you know, in the 15th century, it looked like China was going to be the ones that, that inaugurated that process and that were going to really be the first to kind of pull the different trade networks in the world fully together. Um, and so when we talk about this age of exploration in world history terms, not just European terms, in world history terms, the first explorer that we, that we see that would fit that category is, is Zheng He of China. So let's talk about Zheng He and his story. So first thing we know is that uh, Zheng He and his, uh, and his fleet, he wasn't, just op he wasn't just sailing with a few small piddly ships here. Right? This is, he has this massive fleet of ships sailing on behalf of China, um, of Ming China, and we can see he went far and wide, all right? So um, throughout Southeast Asia, from East Asia, throughout Southeast Asia to South Asia, just basically travels the length of the Indian Ocean trade network. Um, and, and his story is really, it's really striking. Um, he's, a, he's a eunuch, that's, that's an interesting piece. He's a, a Muslim from Western China. So he's kind of an, an outsider to the power structure in many ways, aside from being this, uh, this, this naval admiral. Um, and uh, he's, he's sailing in these massive ships and the, the idea of what he's doing here, uh, he's sort of commissioned by the, the Ming Emperor Yongle, um, is like go out and make connections in order to um, to solicit trade. All right, show off the goods that China has. Tell people, show up and say, "Hey, gang, uh, who wants to see some silk? Who wants to see some uh, porcelain and all this other cool stuff? We've got all the cool stuff. All right, we are the cool kids. You've never seen stuff like this before. So you kind of show it off, and then you say." 
let's talk uh, let's talk trade uh, exchanges, right? Let's let's begin trade. Or uh, who wants to set up a tributary relationship for a special sort of trade partnership relationship with China? And so you're going abroad to it's less about like we want to acquire all their stuff although certainly there's this curiosity find out about what stuff they have elsewhere in the world hence like the giraffe in the background of uh, of, of Jung Ho there um, like find what they have but really it's about demonstrating to the rest of the world you want to be friends with us you want our stuff trust us so China's posture in their whole exploration is just a little bit different from Europe where it's like gimme 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 we want the stuff from the Indian Ocean trade region that's not really why China is out doing this and that makes sense given Europe's positioning before in their story and China's positioning prior to this and their story um, and and we'll say his mission uh, is just impressive on, on a deep level. I mean, this, this, this graphic really should blow you away, right? What you see, the little, the little uh, caravel ship here, this is the size of one of Columbus's ships, all right? Um, so it's like this is uh, the Santa Maria, and this is one of <laughs> Zheng He's ships. Like, this, the, it's basically saying China's exploration stuff is no joke, all right? China was not messing around when they went exploring. Uh, and, and he's off and he's setting up these diplomatic connections and these tributary relationships. Um, he's also kind of like cleaning up uh, the Indian Ocean trade network, right? Sort of like the Mongols did, you know, if we're looking for a, uh, a bit of synthesis here. As the Mongols made the trade, the Indian Ocean, as the Mongols made the Silk Roads safer, so Jung He made the Indian Ocean trade network safer by knocking some pirate skulls around and sort of saying, knock it off, and we're going to sort of, uh, we're going to make this place safer for trade to occur. Uh, so China is putting, under Emperor Yang Le, is putting tremendous uh, energy, resources into these voyages to sort of, in an effort to sort of bring in, uh, bring in wealth back through trade and tribute. And then it all ends abruptly uh, in the 1430s after I think seven of these voyages it ends, and it ends essentially with the death of, of this Ming emperor, uh, this great Ming emperor, Yangle. And the, the new emperor, you can just sort of imagine these Confucian scholars sort of huddling around the new emperor, sort of feeling like they finally have uh, maybe a more sympathetic ear in that emperor. And, and they're saying, you know, like, this is, this is so expensive, and this is so wasteful and unnecessary. This money would be better spent rebuilding infrastructure like the Great Wall. The Grand Canal is in need of repairs. Um, uh, you know, we can, we can help with more uh, agricultural products and irrigation products for the people to sort of support the peasants. Because again, remember in the Confucian thinking, peasant farmers are esteemed and the, and the emperor should care for them like a loving and benevolent father. And these missions are really expensive. They, they might pay in at some point, but I don't see it paying in yet. I mean, I guess we've got this giraffe now. I don't, what, are we, what are we doing here, right? And it's all like we're spending all this money to like open the door for more foreign influence here in China. What are we doing? We're the Middle Kingdom. We're China. We've got the good stuff. The world will find us. If there's something really that great out there in the world, trust us. They come knocking at our door all the time. All right. It's not like we're going to get left out in the cold and get forgotten about. And um, it's also worth noting that there's sort of old, old um, court and bureaucratic rivalries between these Confucian scholars and these uh, these class of, of eunuchs, and that's a whole different strange story. But uh, that Jung He, being a eunuch and being a Muslim, he is a bit of an outsider, and certainly he's not one of the cool Confucian kids. And so there's just this sort of effort made to kind of close him off and shut his missions down. And that is what they do. And not only do they stop them, but they go to such this almost a preposterous degree, right? They say it is illegal. It is illegal to, to travel out into the deep sea like this on behalf of China. It's illegal to even build ships that big again. And maps um, and charts and information that Zheng He had come back with were destroyed, right? So that nobody could do this again. And it's sort of, it becomes nearly forgotten to history uh, for many centuries. It's, the story of Zheng He has really become only kind of uncovered, rediscovered, and re-celebrated again in the last couple decades, honestly. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of, it's, it's profound that the Chinese, that the Ming Chinese would just like shut the door and lock it and just say, we're not doing this anymore. 
And that leads us to one of our, our reflection questions today. I'm going to put these up on Google Classroom, and I want you to write a response to it today. And I'm going to give you two options. Option one, why did the Chinese fail to see the dangers of their failure to project their power overseas? Why, what, what, what about their history or their ideology or, or their anything, or just about their human nature, uh, caused them to fail to see the consequences of pursuing this plan, of pursuing what Zheng He had begun? Or how about this one? Flip it around. Why is it hard to imagine that European exploration, once it had gotten started, would have ever ended that same way? It's just impossible to conceive of that same thing happening in Europe. Why? What's the difference? By the way, that was an exact question, I think, from Guns, Germs, and Steel. All right, let's pivot. Let's flip back to Europe. So Zheng He is this sort of like what if story, the sort of alternate history, alternately imagining what if that had, what if that had gone somewhere? Instead, they shut the door. Meanwhile, a decade or t about 20 years or so after this, Europe's age of exploration really begins in earnest. Uh, and, and what Europe will do will, would be to, let's say, complete the process Zheng He began, which is like a full exploration of, of all the parts of the earth, right? To truly map the whole globe and to truly connect it. Um, they're not going to, you know, not all aspects of this are beautiful, guys. Uh, I assure you of that. Some of it are, are grim. Some, of it, some parts are grim or ugly but it is astounding. The achievement is colossal and astounding. So I just want to understand that, right? As we kind of live into that complexity, um, we don't need to admire all the parts of it. I don't think you should admire all the parts of it, but to, to just say as a whole, like this is this people in this corner of the world become the ones who sort of fully, fully map it, explore it and connect it is something really remarkable. All right, so let's, before we start that, just say why? What were Europeans doing in this? Um, and I'll point to a few factors. Uh, one, they wanted to get around Muslim intermediaries. All right, they, what, what Europeans wanted was access to the Indian Ocean trade network. And if you can close your eyes and imagine where Europe is on a map, all right, and where the Indian Ocean trade network is on the map, you have the Islamic world in between them, which meant that when Europe got access to those trade goods, spices, more than anything else, spices is the big one. When they got those spices, they had already, they were paying a premium. Right? Because there were sort of middlemen, as it were. Like there were traders who had sort of traded them and handed these products off. And every time they get traded, the price goes up, right? Because the traders sell them for more than they bought them. And Europeans wanted access to these and they wanted them to be cheaper. And they said, if we can somehow directly access trade goods in China and get them to European markets, we'll be rich, right? So I always say in this class, when in doubt, when you're trying to analyze, like, well, why did this happen? Like, guess money. It's normally a decent guess to just guess there's some money reason. There's a money reason involved. Um, the Reformation, all right, the, the rivalry between Protestants and Catholics, it sparks uh, missionaries, people who want to go out and sort of win more parts of the world for team Catholicism or team Protestantism. It will also spark uh, refugees, people who are sort of tr seeking, I guess, what we might call some religious liberty or freedom to practice their own religion um, in, in the way that they would like uh, and, and looking for some place where they can do that. Monarchs, European monarchs are in this process as feudalism is sort of decaying or changing. Monarchs are looking for new sources of revenue. All right, taxation is a major source of revenue we'll learn about. But like a new source of revenue can be uh, colonial, uh, colon acquiring colonies, right? And the resources that come with colonies. And with more revenue, you can fight more wars. You can fight more religious wars, right? More wars over religion. You can like, this can sort of like fill the coffers, so to speak. Individual fame and fortune for the explorers and for the kings and queens who send them, right? This is a Renaissance or sort of era of value uh, and people wanted the fame of going with this or another Renaissance value of just sort of curiosity. You know, I just, I just wonder, a humanistic curiosity about the world. Could you guys annotate this with like a detail or an idea with each of these, like some other, some other piece that you could connect it to, right? Could you do that in your own notes? Uh, the, there's lots of this European exploration lasts for quite some time. The first waves we're going to talk about in these next two lessons, there's like the Columbus stuff with the Americas. That's probably the most famous, but more immediately consequential is the Portuguese stuff regarding Africa and, uh, and the Indian Ocean trade network. So let's jump in there. Um, uh, Portugal's like why Portugal? That's an interesting question, right? Like why? What was it about Portugal? Pardon me. What was it about Portugal that uh, that that causes them to be this early leader? Um, and first of all, you'd say probably geography has a part to do with it, right? Portugal is uh, 
very, very close to the Islamic world, right? Portugal is, um, it's a coastal nation, so like they would have some edge in uh, naval technologies, or they'd be the, among the first European nations to get some of these new gadgets and technologies that would lead to that. Um, you also point to a person, you point to Prince Henry the Navigator, uh, a, uh, a Portuguese monarch who, who establishes a whole school, navigational school, uh, sort of just makes this a priority. Um, and the Portuguese also, if you can imagine, I don't have, again, I don't have a good map right here, but um, the Portuguese, like, it's not like they started by going to the Indian Ocean. It starts small. It starts by exploring and then taking control of small islands off of the African coast. And they're doing this because they want to uh, establish sugar plantations, all right? So sugar is, of course, a product that they've, like, been exposed to through the, the Muslim world, right? We've learned all about that. Uh, and, uh, and so they are trying to sort of grow sugar there. Now, by the way, they are uh, to, to do the labor on these sugar plantations on these islands off the coast of Africa. They sort of plug into this African uh, slave trade network and take slaves from Africa, move them onto these sugar plantations. That's like this weird beta test thing of what would become the Atlantic slave trade and what would become all the evils that would follow and process out of that. You can thank Portugal for that, I guess. Uh, but like the Portuguese are doing these sort of baby steps here and that will lead to further and further exploration of the African coast. Um, and, and as they're exploring the African coast, it's like a long time. It's like, a, I, it's more than a decade spent just sort of like every time going a little bit further down the African coast. And an interesting thing to just note or remember is Europeans didn't know how blasted big Africa was. And so like, it's just a sense of like, this is, this is a, an enormous place, right? And so it's just taking forever. And every time they would go further south, they would sort of establish local trade connections and set up... Um, like uh, outposts there, trade outposts, or sometimes military outposts. And they were kind of doing this to block off other Europeans from doing the same thing. They're like a, a rebounder in basketball trying to block out and get the rebound themselves. So they're trying to say, hey, this, this whole route of like um, going south around the southern tip of Africa, this is going to be our route, right? And no one's going to be able to stop at these trade ports because we control these trade ports. So the Portuguese are angling to create a monopoly for themselves. Eventually, um, 1497, Vasco da Gama, which is a, a big name I want you to know here. Vasco da Gama um, uh, goes past the southern tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, um, and, and makes it all the way to, to India. This takes a long time. And even like getting there is sort of a crazy. Like they, they ended up, in order to follow the wind patterns, they ended up sailing so far west that they were nearly to like Brazil. And then they're going south, uh, south of Africa. It's a crazy route that they took. Um, but when, when they can get to the Indian Ocean Trade Network, it's just sort of imagine them saying, somebody take me to India. Who can get me to India? They get to India. And here they're seeing all these trade goods from across the Indian Ocean Trade Network in the central location, buying as much as they can possibly fit on their, ship, on their ships, astounded at how low the prices are compared to what they've been paying. And they're saying to themselves, if we get back alive, we are all rich men. They do. They make their way back to Europe. They're able to sell these luxury spices and all these other goods at a 3,000% profit. And still, at that 3,000% profit, it's cheaper than what Europeans had been paying before, right? So it's like Europeans had been paying this. They come in and sell it for this, right? And they're still making this enormous profit. It's just like, and for Portugal, it's just like, you know, it's almost like, you know, we, they just cashed in. It's like the jackpot. You know, the, the slot machine hit all sevens and coins start pouring out. It's like, holy buckets, this is amazing, right? So they have now gotten directly plugged into the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Um, they're going to, in the process, they will change the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Remember this, it will not be enough to sort of participate just like everyone else. Portuguese traders and later traders from everywhere else, from every other European nation are going to get in and they're going to want to try to take control of it. They're going to try and monopolize it or sort of block other people out from doing it. They're going to sort of try to dominate uh, what's going on in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but it's like it was access to such money like you just couldn't believe. All this new technology. It's always useful, guys, as you learn. Some of you did a LAQ about this recently. Technology that helped, that allowed them to do this. Much of it is from China or the Islamic world, right? These, most of these are not things that were invented in Europe. But you point to things like the astrolabe, the compass. We've already talked about that. A sextant can determine the longitude. 
All right. So very, very uh, useful to determine sort of your east-west bearing. Uh, guns. Guns are a significant part of this story, right? Uh, and a, a caravel is a good word to know. This is the the, the, the European style of a big ocean-going ship. Now, these are smaller than Chinese junks, as we saw, uh, but a caravel would have lateen sails, again, to go crosswinds. So these are some of the technologies that Europeans were using. Next time, we'll talk more about this exploration as it sort of reaches a more mature stage. We just sort of got the ball started, got the story started today. Uh, your homework is to read a short reading that explores the similarities and differences between Zheng He and Columbus. Uh, so that's it, guys. Uh, great work today. I look forward to checking in with you next time. See ya.